right, everybody, welcome to a project that I've been working on for the past 30 days. This project has taken up my entire month of October. I started it literally October 1st and I wrapped it up right around Halloween. And this video, if you can't tell by the length of it, is gonna encompass basically the whole entire build. I decided to do this as one big long video, then a series of videos, uh, just to take some pressure off of the video production process uh, for me. And uh, the fact that this is gonna be like a 55 minute video might have uh, backfired in my face a little bit because I have to talk for the next 50 minutes, which is gonna be interesting uh, to say the least. But anyway, this project here, as you can see, I had already gotten started on it and we're gonna jump around quite a bit in this video um, as I work on uh, this small route module expansion. I'll get into the details about all of that in a moment here. Uh, but we are going to jump around quite a bit. I don't show every single aspect of this process because you guys have seen it a million times. You know what track laying looks like. You know what road laying looks like. So I kind of just took some of the highlights of the build and included that in this video. Uh, so what you're going to see here is some of the process uh, for some of the things that I thought were sort of more relevant than others in terms of the build. Uh, and, we're, and then I'll just kind of gloss over some of the more mundane stuff that you really don't need to see. Um, but I wanted to make this into one big video for one because I've never done a video of this length before so I'm kind of interested to see how it's going to uh, work on my channel if you guys are going to like that kind of thing. You know some of you guys had said that you like more of the long form videos and this is about as long form as it gets right now. Uh, so I figured I'd give it a shot with that in mind uh, and then also the fact that I just could just shoot whenever was convenient for me and just continue to build uh, and work on this project without having to pause to do a voiceover or to re record cinematics or to produce a video or anything like that really allowed me to make a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of progress on this route um, from beginning to end in just one, you know, straight shot. And one of the things that really I benefited from, you know, in, in this sort of process was that, as I had mentioned before, I was able to jump around quite a bit. And when I'm doing a normal video, I like to work on a particular uh, building. Maybe it's, uh, you know, the paper mill or a passenger station or something like that. And I, I like to make the video focused on that and, you know, show it from beginning to, to completion. Uh, but in, it only means that I can focus on that one sort of thing. Whereas my actual build style doesn't necessarily do that. You get a little bit of inspiration here, a little bit over there. And that doesn't necessarily make for the best sort of video format. Uh, but doing it this way allowed me to uh, jump around at any, you know, sort of thing that was catching my attention at the moment. And, uh, and uh, you know, be able to work on that without having to worry about uh, some kind of continuity in the video. So that aside, uh, what is this project exactly? Well... I'm, I'm gonna leave some of the details towards the end, just to keep you guessing. Uh, but this is a 1940s era module. Um, and I'll mention that this module will be able to be operated uh, as a standalone module, or you can connect it to another route. Uh, and I'll get into that in a few moments here. Uh, but I really wanted to challenge myself with this one in, in many ways. Uh, first of all, doing something in the 1940s is way, way outside of my wheelhouse. So if there's any uh, weird, um, you know, details or anything that is completely historically wrong, uh, it's very possible. And uh, at, the, at the point that I'm recording this, I've got the route in the hands of some of my top tier patrons, and they're going to test it for me and take a look at it. And then I'm going to do some more beta testing with some other people. Get some opinions, so some things that you see here might change in the meantime um, before it actually, before this route is actually released. Uh, oh, which I should mention. Uh, so this is just the build part of the video right now. Uh, the route is not available yet, but it will be available very soon. And I'm hoping sometime within the month of November or early December to, uh, to actually be able to get that out. And I'll make another video uh, which will detail all of that sort of stuff. But for now, uh, we're kind of just in the beta process. Uh, so this route tended to be very challenging for me because, as I mentioned, 1940s era stuff is way outside of my realm of knowledge and my skills of building. Uh, so it was a very, uh, very much a learning experience. Uh, and not only that, but there was a lot of assets that aren't really, that I needed that aren't really in the game. So 
Uh, I did go on Turbo Squid and purchase a couple assets and uh, a couple other websites that I've added in here. And as they pop up, I'll try to remember to point them out. But there are some quote unquote custom approach medium assets that are going to be in here. I didn't make them, but uh, I did port them in and uh, specifically for this route. And uh, just to try to fill in the blanks, you know, there's a lot of uh, when you get into a build like this, there's a lot of different um, asset, you know, um, a vacuum, I guess you can call it a vacuum of assets, right? Does that make sense? Uh, so I'm trying to fill that wherever I can, and I, I, I tended to do that a little bit with this one. Um, but with with regards to what the theme of this route is, 1940s era, I wanted to include a uh, like a trolley track down the middle of the road with some street running. Uh, the track in the road is just for trolleys; it's not for any uh, freight or anything like that. And I wanted to make sure that I had uh, a cool yard for sorting some train cars and plenty of switching because who doesn't like doing switching? Uh, and of course, a port scene is perfectly fitting for all of those kinds of things. And uh, I'll get into where I draw my inspiration from maybe in the second half of this video so I don't completely <laughs> run out of things to uh, talk about before then. So speaking of the assets, here is the first one. Uh, I needed a hotel. I wanted like a cool hotel asset. Uh, so I found this one, I believe, on CG Trader, and uh, it needs to be retextured, so I'm going to be retexturing it. I haven't done that yet, so it still kind of looks like this cartoony uh, city skylines sort of look, but we're going to retexture it and uh, make it look a little bit more appropriate. But the model itself, I liked, so we just ported it into the game really quickly, so I had uh, you know a footprint to work with. And uh, yeah, it doesn't look the greatest right now, but it gave me an idea of how much space it's going to take up and what it's going to look like. So then I could fill in the buildings around it and actually continue to detail the area without having to wait for this asset to, to be finished. Uh, so once I get that done, obviously that's going to be included with the route and be, you know, downloadable separately, probably on my website. Uh, but that was the first one. And in fact, the model... Uh, we had to split in half so that it's so we can make it double wide and we separated the hotel sign as well so that it could be uh, put on the front or the side or on an angle and you know so you got some flexibility with it uh, and I think that that is going to really benefit something like that because it's not always going to be on a corner or you know it might not be in an ideal location I like the idea of having the sign separate like on almost any asset like a hotel or a gas station or a uh, car dealership, like any of those things. I hate when I go to, you know, place an asset down and it's got like the sign or some other thing attached to it. Like I want to be able to modify and, and move things around where I want. So some of the other assets that I'm using here, uh, these are my uh, brownstone assets, which currently uh, only patrons have access to at the moment. Um, but they will, again, they'll be available uh, when, you, when you download the route, um, once that's available. And uh, also, they're going to be freeware eventually on my website. I haven't come up with a, uh, an exact plan, a release plan for those yet, but I'm, I'm expecting to release most of that stuff sometime uh, either at the end of 2020, the beginning of 2021, something like that. I have to really sit down and think about how I'm going to, you know, make that public kind of thing. But uh, so lots of my assets in here. Oh, and by the way, I didn't mention that this little module will be payware. Uh, I'm going to keep it on the cheap side. It's only going to be, a, you know, a couple of bucks or something like that. But again, I'll release all those details once I get them figured out and the route is actually complete. Um, but along with the route, as I mentioned, you're going to get a whole bunch of the assets that have only been available to patrons. Um, you're going to get... Uh, actually, I can't even talk about all the other stuff that you're going to get. So I'm just going to... I'm not going to say anything <laughs> right now. <laughs> Let's just talk about the build. Uh, so yeah, continuing on with the waterfront, again, jumping around quite a bit, I think for the next couple of minutes I spend some time detailing this station and trying to get it right, because this passenger station is meant to be sort of a focal point of, of this module, I guess. Uh, and the way that I envision it is that you'd have, you know, passenger trains coming off of the main line and coming down, uh, to this port here, and either passengers would be getting off the train and boarding a boat, or passengers would be coming uh, off of the boat and getting onto the train and then taking the train uh, like up into the mountains kind of thing. So in either way, I wanted it to feel busy, but not so busy because how many how many ships are going to be coming in and going out on any given day uh, kind of thing. You know, I don't want to make it too much, but, you know, 1940s, 1930s is sort of the vibe that I was going for. Maybe it might have been better a little bit before the war. I'm not sure. I don't know. Whatever. You know, when you're building in this kind of time period in this game, it kind of gets a little ambiguous anyway. 
uh, just because of the lack of assets. And most of the assets are generic enough anyway that if you wanted it to be the 1950s, you could probably run it with 1950s diesel and it's going to look fine. And if you wanted it to be the 1920s, you could probably run it with nothing but steam engines and it would look just fine as well. So I guess that's one of the fun things about doing a build like this is that the timeline can be a little ambiguous and adjusted as, you know, as you want. Uh, so it's flexible, which is nice, and that, that gives me a little bit of brief breathing room as somebody who's not super familiar and super, uh, you know, knowledgeable about the details of those time periods. Uh, it leaves a little bit of ambiguity that allows me to just sort of, you know, fudge it where I have to. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so, uh, spending a little bit of time on the waterfront here, lots of vegetation over here, I wanted to have lots of this pond scum crap, which is just such a pain to put down every time I do it, I regret it immediately, but the look is so good, um, you may have seen some screenshots by now, I did share a few at the time of this recording, um, and you'll see some more of this in the cinematics as well, but I, I really like the way that it came out, blending a lot of these shrubs, with the grasses and then the pond scum and kind of making it like this mucky marshy uh shoreline right there because that's kind of what it would i think that's what it would be in my opinion that's what it would look like and from my experience that's kind of what it looks like so i was trying to maintain that sort of effect and uh, i really like the way that it turned out uh, and probably if this was a modern day build if i was doing something modern day i'd probably throw a whole bunch of garbage in there but because this is the 1940s uh, i'm not going to pollute it with a bunch of like uh you know, empty barrels of diesel or anything crazy like that, because that stuff took some time to accumulate. I don't think it would be very prevalent in this time period just yet, even though I know people were doing it back then. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so what else can I mention about this before I, like, start spoiling things? Oh, man, I'm only 11 minutes into this. Whew, it's going to be a long one. <laughs> yeah, so lots of, uh, lots of grass assets here. Um, and just, here we go, jumping around a little bit. Now we're on the far side of this map. Uh, again, I'm using a lot of those S. Myers textures, City Street textures, really, really, like, I'm obsessed with those, and I think I used nothing but those, uh, for the bulk of this. I had to use some regular grass, green grass, ground textures for, like, some background stuff, but the bulk of the texturing here was all done with, uh, those S. Myers textures. Uh, just to get that really kind of like gritty look um, The cobblestone street texture looks phenomenal and it, it was kind of weird at first. I didn't notice it I only accidentally stumbled upon it um, So I was kind of happy that I did notice that there was a cobblestone street texture because it works really really well in here um, And I tried to mix the textures up a little bit and not make it just one big You know slab of cobblestone or whatever you call it, like a big a whole bunch of pavers I spread it out quite a bit and tried to mix in some other cobblestone textures and some dirt textures and stuff like that on top to give it sort of a worn look. And uh, one thing that really helped me with this entire build was looking at a lot of reference photos. Uh, I looked at a lot of stuff on, uh, just on one, went on Google and just searched like 1940s seaport or New York City in the 1940s and 1930s and just kind of had like a whole bunch of tabs open while I was working on some of this just to get an idea of like what the cars were doing, what people were doing, you know, what kind of detail should I put down and how, how should things kind of be laid out. And uh, that helped me quite a bit, but towards the end of this, I started to get really burned out with uh, the details. Uh, I'm trying to make it, I wanted to make it look as busy as possible, so I used a lot of trucks. Uh, you'll see in a few moments, well, in a little bit. Uh, I used a lot of trucks, I tried placing a lot of people, which is something that I rarely ever do. I uh, placed a lot of like cargo bins and, and stuff like that. So, you know, just in an effort to make it feel like a real busy place that's alive and breathing, uh, and I probably could have done a lot more, but there's always more that you can do, you know? You can spend an infinite amount of time on a map or a route or a layout or anything like that and just continue to just pile on detail after detail. But I started to get burned out because I felt like I was making the same things over and over again with these... You'll see, I don't know why I'm even talking about it. It's not even on the screen yet. Uh, but a lot of people like unloading crates and loading trucks and stuff like that. And the effect is great, but um, it did start to overwhelm me after a bit. But as I was saying, looking at the looking at reference photos really helped me with that and really helped with uh, getting the whole overall feel of what the 1940s were. Obviously, I wasn't there for that, and you know, all I have to go by is just a bunch of photos and videos and stuff like that. So, uh, spending a lot of time 
educating myself on that sort of thing. And also having, you know, some people who are very familiar with, or more familiar with that, uh, giving me some pointers and, and, you know, showing me some of the stuff that, uh, you know, maybe I got wrong or I, I could have tweaked or anything like that. So one of the big elements that I wanted to include here was these brownstone houses that I have. I've been looking for a really good excuse to use these, and this just fits the bill perfectly. Again, this main road, I wanted it to feel really busy, so I spent a lot of time placing uh, my brownstones down for, you know, housing, apartments, whatever you would call it, uh, as well as all of these shops. And later on, you'll see I spent a silly amount of time, like, detailing these shops. And uh, actually, I probably don't even show a lot of it. I, I showed some of it um, because it was just ridiculous, some of the stuff I did. You, you, you'll see. Uh, so, you know, trying to line this main street, I wanted it to feel very dense um, and very, again, very busy. And I didn't want there to be a lot of negative space. I wanted it to feel pretty filled in. And I didn't want to just like lay down a whole bunch of trees and kind of call it a day. Uh, so now this area here is just a small little housing development behind the main street there. Again, I had to add this just to add some depth uh, to some of these scenes. It's still a background scene, but I did spend some time uh, putting some details in there. Um, some of the, yeah, here's, here's some right here, some sidewalks. I was going to go as far as like putting mailboxes down and stuff like that. And I was like, no, I have to draw the line someplace. I don't need to be putting mailboxes down on every single street. I was even going to put like road signs, like street names and stuff like that. But again, like by the time I got done with this, my frame rates, like when I was recording the cinematics, my frame rates were dropping down to like the teens and the tens. So I, I need to probably back off a little tiny bit with some of the details maybe in the background. Um, I also used just a tremendous amount of speed trees. I populated like whole forests with speed trees just because I was copying and pasting. So that's that's something that I'm going to have to go back and uh, and redo and just kind of replace some of these speed trees with some billboard trees, like the ones that are like really deep in the back. Uh, because it's just not necessary to have 3D trees all over the place when, you know, something that's like only going to be a background element can look just fine uh, in the billboard style. And uh, there it is. There's the mostly detailed little housing development there. And it, it adds some depth to uh, to the scene. This is kind of right across the street from the train station. So I uh, wanted to make sure that we had some different angles uh, to look at this route uh, from. And I always fall into this trap where I build from a few angles and I, I build for those angles, you know? So like, I'll, it, maybe it's because I'm always filming these things too, but you know, I'll get my camera set up in one spot and I'll build it in such a way that it looks good from that angle. But if you look at it from another spot, it's not so great. And uh, sometimes that happens with, um, I guess the best example I can give is like on the P&B where I didn't make the scenes very deep, unfortunately. So depending on what angle you're viewing it from, you're going to see off the edge of the baseboards. And my first mistake with this route is that I didn't add anything on the other side of the water on on the uh, the shoreline here. And that's something that I did like literally just the other night. And I just made like a really basic mountain range with some trees on it and some grasses and stuff like that. And it made a world of difference because now you can view it from a different angle, you know, that I wasn't particularly building from. So. Uh, that's one of those things you have to take into consideration when you're building is how many different ways are people going to be looking at it like I tend to play from the bird's eye view so I miss a lot of like scenes that occur you know on ground level uh, whereas other people play from ground level mostly so they see all that stuff that's ground level and they don't see the stuff that I see so it everybody's play style is a little bit different so what I'm trying to say is you know, when you're detailing a scene, you have to think about a lot of different aspects of how you're going to look at it and how other people are going to look at it. Uh, because there's just a myriad of ways that, um, you know, one can experience any one of these particular scenes. Uh, and I only just recently started walking around, uh, like in Trains 2019, you can go into like that first person view, like where you're like walking around. I think it's called walk view. I know you can do it in Tain as well, but... Um, I actually, yeah, I think I started doing it in Tain also, but just going into some of my maps and just walking down the streets and just feeling like, what does that feel like? Like, that's not a perspective that I usually get in the game. So it's been kind of changing the dynamic for me to be able to experience my own maps, like in first person view and be able to look around and see, uh, what it looks like from, from that angle. So enough of that. Um, right at this point, uh, we're starting to work more on the 
I guess the shoreline uh, again and uh, the waterfront and in this scene here I wanted to make sort of like a boat graveyard like a boat scrapyard sort of thing but there's like almost no boat assets in this game at least like derelict looking boats so I ended up just spamming out a whole bunch of the same ones and uh, throwing some garbage around them some grasses and some uh, chunks of metal and whatever else, but the idea there is that this is supposed to look like some kind of a scrapyard, particularly like a boat or a barge scrapyard, um, or repair facility, or some something along those lines. Um, and then that track that goes out on the pier there, I don't know what industry that's going to be. I, I literally built this whole thing, got all the other industries kind of like identified and what they're going to produce and stuff like that. And this one that goes out onto the pier or that dock or whatever, I honestly don't really know what I'm gonna do with it. Um, but I thought it looked cool and it was a really good element to include, so uh, I did put that on there and lay the track out. And I'm kind of just hoping that uh, I think of something before I have to release this. Uh, I'm sure I will. I'm sure I'll come up with something or somebody will su suggest something and um, that'll you know make it all come together. But detailing this scene here, a couple of these boats, I'm just kind of like burying them in the grasses and, and all this pond scum and, and that kind of thing. Really trying to fill it in, make it look like these boats have been here for a long time. They've been beached for maybe, you know, a couple of years uh, or whatever, whatever it is. And I, I noticed there's one, I haven't put it down yet. There's a barge that I put down at some point and I make it look like it's, you know, half sunk. But I didn't realize when I did it uh, that the model has like a guy driving it and then on the front there's like a dog and uh it's just kind of funny to see like the guy driving this boat and the dog on the front of this boat or this barge and it's like half sunk into the water and they're just like oh yeah this is just totally normal uh i can't remember if i removed that or not but it doesn't look like it's there so i either placed it removed it or maybe maybe i did it off camera i'm not not 100 percent sure uh but yeah just working in some of these details trying to blend uh, some, you know, different textures into the ground and uh, with different, like, actual 3D objects. And I don't know if you guys are fami familiar with uh, Felix from JR. His, uh, he's got this really, really nice harbor port route that he's working on. It's not released yet. Oh, there's the, the, there it is. <laughs> uh, yeah. He, he has this really great, like, port harbor route. He shared a bunch of screenshots of it on... Uh, on the trains forums and occasionally you'll kind of see some stuff popping up I'm taking a lot of inspiration from him So I want to make sure that I point that out and give him some credit for inspiring me to do some of these crazy uh, highly detailed scenes um, and using you know a lot of like kit bashing ideas and, and, and that kind of thing so uh, Shout out to him and shout out to that route because man that thing is just super detailed It's just incredible look it up on um, it's probably on the JR gallery on the, the forums or something like that you can look uh, but yeah, he, he's definitely contributed a lot to my inspiration for this build. Uh, so just thought I would point that out. So, uh, yeah, another one of the things, this is one of the things that, uh, that Felix actually did was, uh, connecting these boats and his map up with, uh, th this rope. So I thought it'd be fun to do here too. And it turned out to be, uh, really painstaking. So, uh, I don't recommend doing that, but the look is good. I'll tell you that. Uh, Alright, so now we're back to the station. Uh, again, like I said, jumping around quite a bit. Um, I wanted to make this pretty basic looking passenger station a little bit more grand. Um, I, I'm not even really that sold on this particular station, but honestly it was the best one that I could find that wasn't like too big or whatever, like too out of control. So it, this kind of like fit the footprint that I was looking for, but it didn't really have the details that I wanted train going by outside uh so i wanted to dress this up and i was looking at a lot of photos of um oh man which which train station was it i think it was a station in ohio cleveland cincinnati uh one of these like big like 1930s you know grandiose passenger train stations uh i was looking at a lot of photos of that like aerial photos and they had like a lot of gardens and you know, it was just like this real elaborate, beautiful sort of thing. So I was like, you know what? That might be kind of a cool idea to try to incorporate here. Bring a little bit of color in. We can oop, hit my mic. Uh, we can bring in some flowers, uh, add a little bit of a garden. Um, let's bring in some streetlights and just just bring some color and some life into the area. So it's not just like this gray industrial looking, you know, whatever. Uh, so it took me a little bit, actually. I did a bunch of mock-ups off-camera to see, like, what was going to work best. But this is, like, such a weird 
um, shape for this this location and it's probably hard to gauge in this video because I don't know if I've got a shot of it kind of yeah there it is it's kind of on an angle and the you know it's like this really acute angle with the the main road cutting off on one side there and the tracks and kind of constraining everything I didn't want to add like a huge parking lot or anything like that either uh, so I wanted to keep it small and, and realistic in that regard but I wanted it to feel uh, a little bit more elegant uh, a little bit more welcoming since the idea is that these people are going to be coming off these big passenger ships and then uh, either taking a train up into the mountains or, you know, staying in downtown. There's hotels all over the place right across the street there. Uh, so I wanted it to feel a little bit more welcoming and that kind of thing. So this is this is what I came up with and I'm pretty happy with it. I mean, it still feels a little open, like there's a lot of pavement. I can't remember if I filled in the middle part with parking spots or not. There's still a lot of gray pavement, maybe there's some kind of planters or something like that that I could sprinkle around more, but the other issue that I was running into was just with the ground textures. The typical, you know, ground texture issue with this game where it's, you know, it spills out all over the place or you end up with these kind of like weird angles if you're on an angle and, and that kind of thing. So it, it didn't feel quite right um, to fill that in, but I don't know, maybe I'll come up with, with something else. Uh, trying to bring in some period cars here. This is definitely not my forte at all, and I'm already catching some flack about it from some people, so there will be a lot of adjustments to the vehicles, don't you worry. Um, I, the vehicles that I've been putting down have been like a real mix of like 1920s stuff, like up into the 1950s. So, you know, I don't know, I'll, I'll swap out some of the stuff. Like there's, there's a real, again, vacuum uh, of vehicles for this period in this game and i was even considering going on turbo squid and buying some uh to populate in here but it just didn't seem like it was going to be worth it and i just figured i'd work with what we got um and some of the vehicles even and I, didn't, I didn't notice it until like later on some of the vehicles that i put down that are of the period are european and they have its left side driving so <laughs> i didn't even notice it when i was putting them down i was like oh these trucks look good and there's tons of them all over the route like i predominantly built with these things um, they're probably going to stay because there's nothing else to replace with it. But, like I said, I've got some people looking at it right now, and uh, based on the feedback that I get from them, uh, I'll make adjustments accordingly. Alright, so moving right along, I had to just pause it there for a minute just to take a sip of some coffee and wet my, wet my mouth. Halfway, we're halfway through this. Alright, so moving along to the next section. So on either end of this module, by the way, this thing is only about five baseboards in size, I think. Maybe six? Maybe four? Something. It's it's pretty small, which is probably one of the reasons I was able to really <laughs> pull this off in the amount of time that I did. Uh, but on either end of this module, we've got in the, well, in the middle is the, the yard, which I don't even know if I've showed yet. Or I don't think I have. Uh, and then on either end, we've got some coal facilities, uh, coaling facilities. Uh, the one that we were just looking at, this one right, uh, here it comes, this one right here. So I'm envisioning this as being a bit of a transload operation, I think you would call it, um, where we've got this coal dock that's in the foreground here, uh, would unload coal for like local distribution, you know, heating your house or, you know, some businesses, local businesses. So I imagine that being just unloaded right onto the ground from the hopper cars and then people, you know, coming and shoveling it or putting it into uh, that coal conveyor and just, you know, taking it home or to their local business or whatever. And the other half of that is uh, on the water side, and I'm picturing that as having some kind of uh, further, you know, it, it, the coal is getting unloaded onto like barges or boats or something like that and then shipped elsewhere. So it's not a super busy, heavy operation, uh, but there would be enough coal traffic going on here to, you know, really keep you busy switching everything out. Um, but that was the look that I'm going for here. How historically accurate that is, I'm not 100% sure. Um, I know that they were still using coal to like heat and cook with and stuff like that in the 40s in some places. Um, I don't know how accurate the barge operation is, but you know, we can suspend our disbelief briefly, you know, and <laughs> kind of just like, let this be okay. Uh, so that's, that's what I was kind of going for here. Um, and, you know, I, I wanted this to feel like really like mixed, uh, what would it be? Mixed zoning, I guess. So like there's commercial space, there's, um, residential space and then industrial space, all kind of like mixed into one, you know, big area here. You know, the people who are working in these facilities probably live right up the road. You know, they could probably walk there, ride a bike. 
Um, being that this was the 1940s, I don't think everybody owned a car yet. That you know, vehicles were still just um, beginning to become more uh, you know ubiquitous, I guess. And and I've been told you know with the war with World War II going on in the 1940s, uh, there was limited or no operation for uh, production of of vehicles. So uh, there weren't really even a lot on the road to begin with. So I think a lot of people were probably living and working very near each other. Uh, so that is what I was kind of going for uh, in the look of this. And I guess I might as well, we're, we're now at the halfway point, 30 minutes in here. I'm going to get into what this route actually is and where I've got my inspiration from. So if you haven't figured it out by now, which you probably haven't, uh, this is a quote unquote unofficial expansion for the Dry Brook in Asopas Valley. So this is the ports that are east of the interchange track in the DBEV. Now, here's the funny thing, is that this is in the 1940s and the DBEV takes place in the 1990s. So, you can connect this module up to the DBEV. I did make it in such a way that you can connect it up. Everything is should line up properly. Uh, but there is obviously gonna be a 50 year gap between uh, one section and another. But that leaves some options open for me to possibly maybe do a backdated version of the DBEV one day. So with that said, you can operate this module either by itself, or if you have the DBEV and you want to connect it up, you can connect it up. Or, you, you know, run it however you want. Connect it to another route. I don't care. Have fun with it. <laughs> but uh, that was more, that was my motivation for this one, was to create some kind of a module that could stand alone and stand on its own legs and still be a lot of fun to operate. Um, but that could also be ex like an expansion upon another project that I, you know, hold near and dear to my heart. So that said... Uh, the, this whole entire downtown and port area is very, just like the DBEV, heavily inspired by uh, Kingston, New York, where the Catska Mountain Branch ran, and more specifically, the Rondout portion, uh, which used to be its own city way, 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 way back in the day. Uh, but that is where the Catska Mountain Branch began at MP0, right on the waterfront on the Hudson River and, uh, and the, the, the creek there. What's the name of that creek? I'm drawing a blank. It's not the Asopus Creek. Uh, whatever. You can look at it on a map. You'll see the, di the, the, the similarities there. Um, currently, the Trolley M Museum of New York operates in what would be the representation of this yard. Uh, and now, you know, again, as I have said with the DBEV and, and that kind of thing, this is not a copy of, of uh, you know, Kingston or anything like that. Really, what I'm doing is just using it as inspiration. Um, this track arrangement does not exist in real life. Um, just the, the feel of it and the inspiration from it uh, came from there. So none of this is actually totally, you know, it's not, it's, what would you call it? Proto-freelance, I guess, is what it is, is proto-freelance. So I had a lot of fun with that. So my main inspiration, if you want to look into it, go to, uh, just look up the Trolley Museum of New York and uh, look at it on Google. And, uh, you know, you'll get an idea of, of where I'm coming from with, with a lot of this. Uh, but this is what I grew up with. You know, I grew up in this part of town, so it, it really... Uh, it really inspires me. There's, you know, it's it's in my blood. It's in me. So <laughs> I draw a lot of inspiration from this area, especially with uh, the DBEV, because that is, uh, you know, it's based it's based on that. So with that said, um, I did spend a lot of time trying to. We just missed it with some of those power lines there. Uh, on this route, I spent a lot of time doing things with power lines and catenary and power poles and. Uh, you know, in a lot of the photos that I've seen, um, I, you know, I've got so many books of the, the Catskill Mountain Branch when it was, you know, part of the New York Central and photos of the Rondout area and stuff back then. And one of the things that I noticed is that there is a lot of wire in the air and a lot of utility poles in the air. And I don't know what they all were for. Uh, there's probably power, different types of power and, you know, telegraph lines and God knows what else was going on. So just a lot of what I like to call visual noise. So I wanted to make sure that I incorporated that. So I did a lot of power lines. I did a, I do a lot of stuff with these, uh, um, the catenary for the, uh, the trolleys, which I think I, I do a little bit on camera. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, so I spent a lot of time doing that sort of stuff to, you know, to the point where it really made my head spin. Uh, but this is one of those scenes that I wanted to detail and again, bring to life as best as possible. In every photo I see, these places are like bustling like mad. You know, there's crates, shipping crates, and boxes, and 
you know, people working all over the place with dollies and, you know, dragging, you know, truckloads of this stuff all over the place. So I wanted to try to replicate that sort of busyness with the assets that we have. And uh, this is what I came up with. And I tend to do... I don't want to say I came up with a formula for it because that, that makes it sound really bad. Um, but, you know, there's only a handful of assets that we could really utilize for this sort of thing. Uh, so once I figured out what those assets were, you know, I found some of the variations of them and just sort of mixed and matched on each different section uh, to make things just a little bit more visually interesting and a little bit more photogenic, photographic, uh, and that kind of thing. So now we're going to start placing down some cars uh, on the side of the roads. Uh, again, I wanted to have a lot of parked cars and, uh, you know, make it feel like there's a lot of people, hap you know, living here and, and moving around and shopping and whatever else. Uh, so I pretty much just came up with a whole, like, list of vehicles that I thought would work. And uh, I just, you know, picked from that over and over and over again. So, and then at some point I got into, like, copying and pasting, like, whole sections of them because it just took so long to place them and, like you know, line them up and all this and that. So copy and paste tool, it could be a little bit finicky, but man, it could be a lifesaver uh, when it when you can get it to work. Uh, and if you didn't notice, so I placed all these buildings down off camera because uh, it was just, you know, this was probably two or three days worth of work just trying to get all the buildings that I liked and um, get them positioned in, in such a way that actually looks good. And one of the biggest problems that I'm running into is I'm using all these JR downtown buildings, but all of the storefronts are boarded up. They're all covered in like, not all of them, but they all look abandoned. So I spent a lot of time, and I think some of the clips coming up, this might be one of them. I spent a lot of time trying to cover up these storefronts with other storefronts. So, you know, I did a lot of kit bashing on this where um, there's a whole section. If you look up shop front or storefront on the download station, there's a whole bunch of assets that are just sort of like the facades of buildings, um, which you just saw me place in a, a moment ago there. And I downloaded all of those and just started mixing and matching and seeing how I can clip them into these JR downtown buildings or how I could take other assets and just kind of cover up uh, some of these empty windows and abandoned looking places because, you know, in the 1940s, this was a busy, you know, populated, busy stuff, you know, these buildings were all newish, you know, so I don't want them to look like they're old and abandoned or anything like that. They're all new, you know, people are living and working there right, you know, right now. So they shouldn't look quite as, uh, as boarded up and beat up as they do. And I know whoever the asset creator was, uh, cause I know these came off of Turbo Squid, uh, was just trying to, you know, keep them simple and, and make it, you know, whatever. Uh, but I would almost just prefer if it was just some, just a, an empty window there instead of like it being boarded up, you know? Uh, so a lot of time doing this sort of thing where I would take some of these facades and just try to clip them in and see how that looked and then, you know, cover them up a little bit with some other details, uh, people or, uh, you know, fruit baskets or whatever I could come up with just to try to hide some of the, uh, some of that sort of stuff. Uh, and I think it worked out pretty well. Some of them don't look quite as convincing as others, so I may have to go back and, and fine tune some of that stuff. But for the most part, and, and by the way, I didn't do every building either. Uh, that would have just been too much. I only did, well, I shouldn't say only, I probably did about 75% of them. So some of them I couldn't clip anything into. Some of them, nothing would look right. So I just ignored it and just said, I'm gonna have to live with it, or I put some people in front of it. Um, but again, this is another one of those types of things that you could just spend like an infinite amount of time just trying to place more and more people and more and more details in front of everything. Um, so here at this point, I'm trying to detail some of these, uh, the, the front of these brownstones, and I didn't want to go into too much depth with it, but I thought maybe adding some trees and stuff in there would be helpful, uh, and also... Uh, that brick wall to uh, create like a little privacy barrier. That's what I've seen at least in New York City is that's usually how they're designed. Uh, so I wanted to make sure I kept up with that. So another uh, visual thing here, uh, all of these marquees, all of these signs, I wish there were more of these and I'm kind of debating making a whole bunch of my own. Um, but in, in all the photos that I saw from the 1940s, the buildings are just covered in these things all over the place. And there's only like maybe a dozen of these on the download station. So I had to like kind of reuse some of them or be really uh, picky about where I, where I placed them. 
Uh, one of the things that really frustrated me with these is that they're not double-sided. They could have been easily made to be double-sided, but you know, they're invisible from one angle. So I had to like just double it up um, in order to get it to be viewed from both sides. Uh, simple fix for whoever the asset creator is. And again, if I try to make them myself, maybe I'll uh, take a stab at doing it and, and making them double-sided so that it's not such a pain to place. I'm placing tw twice as many assets, you know? But anyway, I'm not going to sit here and critique somebody else's assets because these are still more assets than uh, than I actually have to my name. So <laughs> uh, I'm just trying to, you know, give some positive feedback or whatever, some kind of feedback to uh, whoever the author is. But they, these are really great assets to uh, to just jazz up any uh, any scene. I think that some of them probably could work more in modern day times, too, uh, and not just uh, transition era or 1940s or 50s. Uh, it just depends on how you use them, and they look really good. I mean, again, my only complaint is, aside from, you know, the fact that they can only be viewed from one side, uh, they're pretty good otherwise. Um, and I'd love to, I would really love to see some more of those. And again, I may, maybe I'll try to make some marquees or something like that in the future, but uh, it's always tough for me to balance my time between video production, and I say this all the time, uh, building my routes and making assets and doing all the other things that I have to do, especially like with the Patreon uh, benefits that I have to deal with every month and that kind of thing. So it's a lot. I've got my hands full is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> uh, so moving right along here, I thought it would be good to detail some of the backside of this building here uh, and jazz it up a little bit with some more boxes and trucks. I probably placed way more trucks than actually existed in the 1940s, but again, uh, that's something that can be easily fixed. Um, but I do like the look of it, so I, you know, it is what it is. Again, we may have to just suspend our disbelief for a little bit so that, you know, we can kind of get away with, uh, with this sort of thing. And, you know, something that I really enjoy doing is making these vehicles, you know, look like they're in sort of like mid-action, like the truck is backing into the loading dock or making a turn or something like that, because... You know, the the actual moving traffic uh, in this game is uh, it leaves a lot to be desired. So uh, it's almost better, in my opinion, to treat this more like a model railroad and have static traffic. Even though I would much rather have active traffic like something in City Skylines, I don't think we are ever, ever going to get to that level with this game, unfortunately. But I would love it. I would love it if we could. So until we do, it's it just comes down to faking it. Uh, and I think some of these trucks are the ones that I was mentioning earlier where uh, you could, if you look at the cab, you can see that they're, they're European left side driving. Okay, so now we are on the northern side of the map here, the route or module or whatever we're going to call it, uh, at the other coaling facility. And I imagined this as being like a coal power plant. I'm, I'm I guess, kind of picturing it being uh, like a substation or a power plant to provide power for the trolley line there. Um, and maybe, I don't know, maybe some local businesses or industries or something. I'm, I'm really not too sure. Really, I was just looking for an excuse to uh, build one of these power plants or one of these facilities that had uh, like side loading uh, off a trestle. So I loved the idea of um, seeing like those coal hoppers go up on the trestle along the side of a building and then the coal chutes underneath the trestle just empty out right into the side of the facility. And I just thought that that was a really unique thing. I've seen photographs of it, and people have modeled it in like HO scale and N scale. And uh, I wanted a, <laughs> I just wanted an excuse to, to build something like that here. So I think it looks really cool. I think I got a couple shots of it in the cinematics at the end. Uh, and I think you'll agree that it is a, a nice, uh, unique touch to have there. Uh, I might have to adjust or tweak some of the details that I included there because I wanted it to actually be able to unload. So I had to fake a couple of things. And, uh, and then again, I also used just a regular trestle, uh, rail trestle with uh, tracks on it. Um, it's not like an industry or anything like that, so I had to fudge what I did underneath, uh, some of the details underneath to make it look like there was actual uh, like loading docks or loading bays or whatever you would call it. Uh, what did I call it before? Bunkers? I don't know. I, I, I used the word a minute ago. I'm getting, whew, I'm getting tired here. Um, okay, so now I'm, I kind of got most of this route I guess it's the bulk of it done and which is funny because I haven't even showed any of the rest of the, the map that goes up into uh, towards the rest of the debev and I actually don't know if I did any of that on camera now I'm thinking about it there's only a couple of clips left coming up here uh, but I know at this point I was feeling comfortable enough to actually just focus on doing detail work 
Uh, so I did spend a lot of time uh, coming back down and, uh, and detailing some of these scenes, placing trucks and placing more crates and boxes and different things like that. Um, and uh, just really populating the area again. Uh, I want to go back to talking about the trolley wire because now I can't remember if I did any of it on camera. And I'm guessing I didn't because it was so tedious. Uh, I didn't want to, you know, I wanted this trolley street running thing and I wanted it to be kind of similar to the Dayton and Troy. Um, but I did not want to run into the same problems that I ran into with the Dayton and Troy. See, this was a learning experience here. I learned something from the D&T. And I learned something from this route too. And that is... I didn't want to use those trolley wire poles that, you know, were going to sit in the middle of the road. I didn't want to deal with that. I thought it looked like crap, you know, and I'm still very unhappy about that. And when I'd finished the, the Dayton and Troy, a lot of people had mentioned to me that I could have connected some of the, the wires to like buildings and power poles and stuff like that to, uh, you know, keep the uh, supports out of the road. And uh, so I kind of took that uh, advice to heart and uh, I... <laughs> I spent so much time. I hand laid the the wire for the for the tr the main trolley wire, and then I ran connections from between power poles across the road or from a power pole to a building. And uh, again, this was in an effort to you know not just to be more realistic, but to also um, create that visual noise that I was saying I, I saw a lot of in in these old photos where there's just wires all over the place. Uh, so this was a good opportunity to to sort of uh, create that visual noise, but man, is it tedious. I, I don't think, I don't know, I don't know if you're actually going to really see it, but there was a lot of spline points laid from one wire to another, um, power poles on top of each other, and, and the likes of which is just kind of like mind-bending and mind-numbing in my opinion. Um, but the effect is what I wanted. That's really what I'm getting at. The effect is what I wanted because it keeps any of the supports off of the road. It looks pretty realistic in my opinion. Um, and I think it's going to be functional, but we'll have, uh, that, that's yet to be determined. We haven't fully tested it out, uh, with anything just yet. So hopefully I don't have to make too many adjustments with that because it was very painstaking to get it all to line up and match perfectly. But yeah, you can see some of the, the wires crossing the road there. Uh, and a few other spots too. You might see it in the cinematics. I'm not, I can't remember. My mind is just melted after all this. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're coming up, getting kind of close to the end here. I think I got another five minutes of talking at least. Um, at this point, I'm like trying to just copy and paste some of these cars just to save me. See, I love that view there. Just to save me the time of rotating things and placing them and this and that. Um, yeah, all right, now here we are. Uh, this is up on the other side of the port. We are on the western side of this module. Um, right at the edge of where this is going to connect over to the DBEV. Wow, I can't believe I glossed over all that. Man, there's a lot that I didn't include in this video. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't even realize there was stuff that I, I just is missing out of here. Um, maybe I'm missing some clips. Maybe I didn't get all the clips in here. I'll have to double check. Maybe, I, mean, I don't know. We'll, we'll, I gotta look. Not a big deal. Uh, but yeah, now we're on the, um, the western side. Uh, I had already placed down some of these background neighborhoods here and added some detail. We're not far from the tracks right here. You might see it off to the left in a moment. Um, but I wanted to make sure that there was a couple of like really nicely detailed scenes that were trackside. Um, and for some reason, a church with a cemetery seemed like a good option. And uh, I think I I built this right around the same time as I did my PNB live stream where I did a similar build with the church and the, and the cemetery. So I think that that's why it was all fresh in my head. I can't remember which I did first or, or second, but... Uh, that's sort of where my mindset was at that time. Uh, but I didn't want this to be just a really simple, you know, plop the church down, call it a day kind of thing. I wanted to do some landscaping here, so I built this little garden, uh, with this path around it, um, and just try to make it feel a little more, uh, complete, I guess. Uh, it's... It, it looks good. I'm happy with how it comes out, uh, to be honest with you. And this path was interesting. You could rewind that and look at that again, because it's a good way to, to make a circle. If you ever have to make a circle out of uh, splines in this game, uh, you just just see what I did there, because it worked pretty well. Um, so yeah, just doing some like basic scenicing around here. I didn't really do anything super crazy, I don't think. Those tombstones were part of the church, um, so I didn't have to worry too much about that. Um, just adding, you know, a couple fences and some shrubs and grasses here and there. Um, these CL hedges are great. 
you know, like I highly, highly recommend them. They are billboard style, um, but they look really, really good and they fill up an area pretty good. The only problem with them, I think, is the, the LOD on them is kind of uh, not so great. Uh, if you zoom out just a little bit, they disappear. But I mean, you could change that in the config yourself. Um, okay, so that section of track right there, that's where the connection will be. There's two portals there for the trolley line and uh, one for the trolley line and one for uh, the, uh, the, the regular main track. Um, but what you can do is just delete those portals and connect to the deep ev right there uh, and run some trains down if you want. Uh, again, I think that this whole thing is going to look just as good with, um, uh, with modern, not modern, maybe it'll look okay with modern stuff, I don't know. You'd have to swap out some stuff. But some diesels, I mean, first and second generation diesels will probably look really good on here, uh, as well as, uh, obviously steam. Uh, and I neglected to mention that probably one of the most important things is that uh, I am working with Steve Laro of k &L Trains on this project. So I'm not going to disclose what we have in store for that just yet because it's not done. And I'm not even going to really hint at it. But you guys can use your imagination with, with those, you know, those things. Uh, and we'll, as soon as, you know, everything is done on both of our parts, uh, we'll do, you know, our normal release videos. And you guys will be notified as to when and where uh, the, the assets or the route and whatever else is going to be available. Um, so just keep an eye out for that. But this, you know, this is the build video. And I just wanted it to be a standalone uh, thing for your viewing pleasure uh, without having to turn this into a series. I, th I think if I made this into a series, it would probably uh, just go on for months and months. And uh, it, I just, I needed to just get something done, <laughs> you know, and just see it from beginning to end. Uh, but I think that's it. This is probably the last clip here. I can't believe that I didn't shoot any of the stuff in between. There's like a whole uh, Main Street section and stuff. I didn't detail it, but there's a whole Main Street section uh, in the middle of this. Um, one of the things that I did make for this also was some uh, like World War II propaganda posters, uh, which I'm hanging all over the place on the route. I didn't show that here because I uh, actually produced those after I got done recording this. So uh, that's a separate thing. But those will also be included in, in uh, with the route and, and that kind of deal. Um, but that's, uh, that's it. That's, wow, I can't believe I just talked for 51 minutes. Whew. All right, well, here's some cinematics for your viewing pleasure. Enjoy the eye candy for a little bit. I'm going to drink a glass of water and relax. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and this build. I'll make sure to let you know once it's available. Um, it is already available to patrons in the executive tier over at patreon.com slash approach medium. So if you're interested in joining that, go take a look at that. Um, thank you so much to all my current Patreons, patrons, Patreons, whatever. Uh, you guys are the best. Uh, and I uh, thank everybody else for watching this video. I'll see you guys in the next one.